good to see each and every one of you here today. Welcome to Lillington Baptist Church. So happy to have you with us. Um, if you're a visitor with us, we'd like to have a record of your visit. There's a visitor's card in the pew pocket in front of us, in front of you. If you would, just complete that. And when the um, ushers come by with the offertory plate, just put it in there. We'd just like to have a record of your visit. Um, have a few announcements to go over with you. Um, the quilt up here is by our quilting ministry. That's in celebration of the 90th birthday of Hilda Ainsley. So wish her a happy birthday. Um, Operation Christmas Child. Uh, this month, they're collecting combs and small brushes. So please keep that in mind. Um, Baptist Children's Home Food Roundup for 2024. This is where they're collecting food for the uh, Cameron's Boy, Boys Home. They said that you know gift cards are an option, can be dropped off at Little River. Um, so please keep that in mind as well. Um, Women of Living Faith, they'll be meeting on Tuesdays at 930 in the Fellowship Hall. Women on Mission, they meet this Tuesday the 9th at 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And then this Wednesday, we do have a Fellowship Hall meeting or a meal. Um, it'll be Brunswick stew prepared by our Baptist men. And so please come out. We'll have Cindy McPhail coming, talking to us about Operation Christmas Child. So that'll be our mission moment. So this Wednesday, make sure you come out for that. Um, we also have coming up on Friday the 12th, uh, Children's Ministry will be having a movie night with pizza from 6 to 8 p.m. And then last but certainly not least, I want to remind each and every one of you about 5 o'clock this evening. Um, we will be having a PowerPoint presentation for our pastoral candidate that the uh, Pastor Search Committee is bringing to us. Uh, from what I understand, they've got a PowerPoint presentation. They'll give us a lot of information, um, give me an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, they may or may not have answers, but it's answers that at least they can be getting in the next week or so. So please come out and join us for that. That will be here in the fellowship, or excuse me, not fellowship hall, here in the sanctuary. Um, so be here at 5 o'clock for that. And then next Saturday in the fellowship hall, we'll be having a meet and greet uh, with the pastoral candidate and his family. Uh, that will be at 5 o'clock. And then the following Sunday on the 14th, um, he will come and share a sermon with us. And at that point, the congregation will make a vote. So... You know, tonight, next week, just continue to be in prayer. We haven't had our pastor search committee prayer because they have focused on a candidate. Just trust that everyone is praying specifically for our candidate. Um, so please keep that in mind and look forward to seeing everybody back here at 5 o'clock. Morning. Morning. How are y'all? I've got a verse I was reading this week and it really hit me and I thought, boy, that's a good one. I mean, it really spoke to my heart. Psalm 32, 10. David wrote Psalm 32 and he says this, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. I love that. Love that thought. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your mercy surrounds us, and we would pray even today, Lord, that your mercy would surround each of us, uh, this room, this building, this land, our lives today. Lord, thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, fresh out of the oven this very morning, and we thank you for that. Lord, we give this service to you. We look to you to speak to us, to make real your word uh, as we sing, as we worship, as we pray, whatever uh, you lead us in, in this day, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. I love that. There's always a but or a but God, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing our praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're blessed to be in your house of worship today. We're blessed to have you join us too, Lord. And Lord, we turn our attention to those who need our prayers. We have folks in our church family that have lost loved ones. 
We have folks in our church family and in the community that are sick and ailing. We pray for them, Lord. We pray for their peace and comfort that you give them. And Lord, may we open our hearts and our wallets to the needs of the church and to the community as we offer our tithes. Use them to do your will, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning again. Isn't it a beautiful day? I mean, except for the pollen that everybody keeps coughing about, right? But it's a beautiful day. God's blessed us in many, many ways. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> you know, we talked about the triumphant entry. That's Jesus coming into Jerusalem, even though he had to weep over their unbelief. And then we talked about the triumphant exit, which is him coming out of the tomb, very triumphant over sin and death and hell and the grave and the devil and all of that. Today we're going to talk about triumphant living because, you know, it's one thing, I don't know if y'all noticed, but there were some people who were here last week, they're not here today. Just say it, okay? Why? I, I don't know. That's not whatever. But the point is, triumphant entry is good. Triumphant exit, even better. But he didn't do that just so we'd have an Easter season. He did it so that we could have triumphant living. And he wants us to walk in trust or faith. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, some mornings I get up and say, ugh, right? Kind of stuck on yuck. Is anybody with me on that? I'm not a morning person anyway. And so when it's not a good morning, and then you add the fact that I'm not a morning person, well, it can be a pretty rough morning, right? And that's just the way it is. But uh, I, I need to tell you one story about trust. <clears throat> so we were in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, I don't know much about Michigan. I know that it's snowing in northern Michigan right now. And I know that in Florida, where we used to live, everybody in Michigan came there for spring break. I remember being on I-95. Okay, this is a real story. 45 miles an hour, I'm going, what is this? All the lanes were full. So I started looking at license plates, and there were at least 23 states represented. Why are they coming down to Florida? To see me, of course. And... Um, so we started, I said, Linda, get the map out. Find us a state road somewhere. And so we found an exit. And guess what? That state road was as clear, four lanes, maybe seven cars, you know, no traffic. So we got off that nasty interstate. Anyway, that had nothing to do with anything. It's not even in my notes. Anyway, so we were in Kalamazoo. It was February-ish, March, whatever. Still kind of cold. And the guy said, you know, you can walk. We were at a camp uh, doing a conference, uh, marriage conference thing. And the guy said, you can walk on that ice. And I looked at him like, mm, I don't know. See, I grew up in Mobile, South Alabama. Uh, it did freeze sometimes. But nobody would walk on, a, on the ice. Why? It cracked just like that, real thin. He said, well, I'm just saying that they'll drive trucks out there. Matter of fact, some people will get real brave in March when it starts getting a little warmer. They'll still drive their snowmobiles out there on the lake. And, of course, some of those snowmobiles are at the bottom of the lake because the ice would crack and tsh, what do you do? You're not going to get it out. Trucks, same thing. Truck, swish. Bye-bye, truck. So I said, well, and so I walked on it. Sure enough, it held me up. I would never do that anywhere, you know, south of anywhere. And so um, I had a friend one time. He said, he said this. He was talking about ice that you can stand on. He said it's better to have thin faith in thick ice than it is to have thick faith in thin ice. Isn't that true? And that's what we're looking at today. This whole thing of trusting in the Lord, like that verse I read, Psalm 32, 10. 
The sorrows of the wicked, they're a bunch. But his mercy surrounds those who trust him. Now, does that mean everything's all hunky-dory? No. It just means that there's a place of trust. And that's what we're going to look at uh, today. Because why? Because the Father, that's, that's his design. He designed everything to be orderly, fruitful, um, uh, delicious, if you will. And Jesus came with that same mindset and, and he recognized wherever he was, there were some things not good. We're going to talk about some of those today. But what did he do? He, he encountered those things face to face, toe to toe. He won the battle over sin and evil and death and bad and the devil, all of that. He's uncontested, undefeated. He's the champion as uh, one song puts it so well. And he wants us to walk in that same victory. We sang victory in Jesus. Uh, and uh, Christ in Christ alone. Well, that's a good song. Why? Because in Christ alone, he is our victory. I mean, listen, I'm married to a fabulous wife, but I'm not going to trust in her for my salvation. That would not be good, nor is she going to trust in me. Although, I can't imagine a better husband. I mean, what can I say? Anyway, the victorious life. He wants us to walk in newness of life uh, with a new nature, his kind of nature. That's what he wants. So we're going to look at that. Look at uh, Matthew 7, and it says in your bulletin that we're going to start in verse 15, but we're actually going to start in verse 13, okay? Verse 13 of Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is talking, and um, uh, he, it's in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult, or confined, or whatever, is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets. You, you do understand there's some people who will not tell you the truth. They're called false prophets here, and those are the worst. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Look good on the outside, but on the inside, watch out. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? No. Or figs from thistles? No. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good, bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Now skip down to verse 24. He's talking about all this, Matthew's putting it all together. And by the way, just so you'll know, Jesus probably told this a lot, okay? I mean, just like you've, you know, if you find a really good burger place or barbecue place, you tell it a lot, right? You just do. That's just what you do. And so he told this a lot. Therefore, verse 14, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. We sang about that. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And when I was in uh, living in Fort Worth, they were building a building, and one of the things I noticed, it was going to be a nice building, but they, they, they for, took forever putting in pilings. I don't know how deep the pilings were. But they just took a long time. Why were they doing that? They were trying to find bedrock in Fort Worth. I don't know where it was or how, how they did it, but they did it. Then they built a building on top of that. Nobody ever noticed the bedrock, the pilings, or none of that kind of stuff. It's underground. But they knew that. And anybody who's ever had to deal with uh, foundation stuff knows that too. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Some of you have got places on the beach, right? 
Are you concerned during hurricane season they might get hit? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up in Mobile, okay? We had hurricanes every year. And I went to the beach enough. Uh, when a hurricane comes to a beach house, bye-bye, beach house. That's just the way it is. And that's what happens. And that's exactly what he's saying here. The sand just washes out from under it. The rain descended. The floods came. The winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell. And great was its fall. So he's talking about uh, uh, several different things here. But I want to give you one more peek at something he's saying. I want you to turn over about three or four pages to Matthew chapter 12. Okay? Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to mention a couple of things in there. Um, Jesus is talking, and in verse 33, all right, verse 33, he says this, either make the tree good, uh, how do you make a tree good? We're going to talk about that, and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. Now, he's talking to some folks, you bunch of snakes would be a loose translation. How can you, being evil, speak good things? Time out. You know, when um, God was speaking to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, he said the seed of the serpent would be an enemy of the seed of the woman. This is part of it. I mean, it's been going on for thousands of years, but this is part of it. The seed of the serpent, a brood of vipers. They're, their nature's like a snake. And they're against Jesus. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I kind of go ahead and give some marriage counseling here. There are times when I've said something and I said I was, I should have said that, forgive me. And or sometimes, and very, 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 very rarely has Linda Go said something. But with the point we've had a discussion about is. The mouth speaks out of stuff that fills the heart. No, I didn't mean that. Yeah, you did at that moment. Why? Because that's what regurgitated out. Y'all ever had a friend like that? I'm not going to say your husband or wife would never say anything to you. But anyway, right? Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. You just got to know it. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man... Out of the evil treasure thing brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak that will give account of it in the day of judgment. That's a scary thought. For by your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. He's talking about what's in your heart. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Because the whole point of all of these stories, pictures, everything, you've got to You've got a wide way and a narrow way. Okay. You've got a good tree and an evil tree. You've got good fruit and bad fruit. You've got a treasures, the treasures of a heart coming out, either good or bad. And then you've got a foundation. You're building a house. And in and, and every one of these pictures really has one basic truth. The nature of the way, the nature of the tree, the nature of the heart, the nature of the house is revealed when it's squeezed in some way. It's kind of like the guy asked, what do you get when you squeeze a lemon? Well, the first thought, you lemon juice? Well, it depends. If you put an injection of something else in there, then the something else would come out with the lemon juice. Whatever's inside is going to be what comes out. That's the point. And that's what we find here. And uh, this is not something that's just Jesus talking. I mean, Moses, when he's uh, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means second law, the second giving of the law, the telling of it again after the 40 years of wandering, wandering, wandering. He says, listen, here's what I'm going to tell you. And he makes this statement. He says, choose life. That's the point. He tells them, don't, don't, don't mess with wrong, choose life. And that's what Jesus wants us to understand. So let's kind of walk through this and just see what God has to say to us. But before we walk through it, what do we want to do? We want to ask God to speak to us, right? The one thing. 
that we need to hear. Why? Well, because you don't graduate from needing to hear from God. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah, I did that. I, I already done that. Okay. Every day we need to hear from him. So let's ask him. Father, thank you for your word uh, that we've read. And now, Lord, would you help us get it? The one thing each of us needs, we don't know what that one thing is. You do. And, Lord, even if, it, uh, even if it's conviction, Lord, would you help us receive it wholeheartedly? If it's encouragement, if it's comfort, whatever, Lord, help us receive what you give us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, first thing, number one, good fruit. How many of you like to go to the grocery store and get a good bag of something? Oranges, apples, whatever. Uh, we've done that. And rarely, I, I can remember one time uh, we got a bag of grapefruit. And we cut it open. It was kind of dry and bleh. You know what Linda Gill said? Well, I'm taking these back. Why? It just wasn't, wasn't good fruit. On the other hand, I was uh, speaking at a church in Central Florida one time, and a, a family invited me over for lunch. I said, great. It was in Inverness, Florida. Guess what they had in the backyard? A grapefruit tree. He said, you want some grapefruit? I said, Sure. Gave me a big old box of grapefruit. I mean, they were so, so good. Delicious. That's what you want. Good fruit. And that's what God likes. He, he likes it. When he created everything, he said, oh, this is good. Every day he would say, this is good, this is good, this is good. Then at the end, he said, this is very good. He likes good fruit. And James 1 says, every good gift comes down from the Father of light. So he is good. He gives good. He likes good. And then we've read in these scriptures in Matthew, a good tree produces good fruit. When I was a kid growing up, we had probably the ugliest pear tree in the universe in our backyard. But it produced absolutely fabulous pears. Mother would make them into pear preserves. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you this. I know this is not, not lunchtime, but she'd make homemade buttermilk biscuits put butter on that, you put those pear preserves on that. Oh, my goodness. It was just so good. But that was an ugly tree. It was a good tree. Why? Because it produced really, really good fruit. Now, I have a sneaking suspicion. I don't know why, because here's the tree, and right here there's a depression. And they tell me, they told me when I was a kid, we think there used to be a well there. I'm thinking, I bet there's still a well there. It's just covered up. But those roots of that tree... Probably, I don't know this for sure, but probably went down to there and got up that water and nutrients and man, that made good pears. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some trees are so, my, my brother, when we, he was living in Tampa one time in a neighborhood that used to be an orange grove, then became a neighborhood. Kind of like around here, you know, it used to be a farmland, it grew stuff, and now it's a neighborhood, right? And he, we were, we were visiting, he said, y'all want some oranges? I said, Sure. So he went down the road, you know, just a few houses down. There was a pond there. And around the pond were orange trees. And he picked those oranges, brought them back. Can I just say, they were not very pretty. They weren't clean. They weren't washed. But were they ever good? I mean, they were just absolutely the sweetest, juiciest oranges you can imagine. And that's what the father wants us to be. He wants us to produce good fruit, good results. Um, and, and this is not just something Jesus said. Romans 2, you can read it later on. Paul said, listen, you got bad stuff, you're going to face bad judgment. You got good stuff, you're going to face good uh, what God can give. And, and he's not talking about uh, de depending on works because Romans doesn't do that. But Jesus talked about this. Remember John 15? They're walking from the upper room to Gethsemane, and he's walking along, and he says, by the way, you guys are branches. I'm the true vine, and if you abide in me and let my words abide in you, you'll bear much fruit, and the Father's going to be glorified. In other words, the Father's going to brag about, the people are going to brag about the Father because of the fruit that comes from you obeying my word and praying my word. So he, he talks about that. So good fruit. Got that one. Good treasure. 
So the father wants good treasure from a good heart. Well, how does, how does that happen? Well, there's, there's a problem. I don't know if you've noticed it or not. I've mentioned this before, but your kids and grandkids are just wretched. Okay? No, they're sweet. They're sweet when they're asleep. And when they smile for a picture. And you can put it on Facebook or Instagram or something like that, right? But sometimes they're not so sweet. Sometimes they're just, oh, I'm just saying. Um, bless their little hearts kind of a thing. By the way, you know, in the South, I don't know if you've noticed this. Or not, I've not I've never told you this before. You say, bless your heart, you can pretty much say anything about anybody. Like, she's so ugly, bless her heart. Or, isn't he the stupidest thing, bless his heart. You know, you can say anything, but that's not biblically. Okay, good. <laughs> Just saying. Um, but I want, I want to show you this because some people really, really, really have questions about this. I want you to turn to 1 John 3. I know this is going to be a, a, a challenge to some of you, but... 1 John 3, uh, after Hebrews, then James, you know, 1 John, before Revelation, that kind of part of the New Testament. Uh, in 1 John 3, <clears throat> there's some verses there that, that really get a lot of people riled up. What does that mean? So John's writing to believers, okay, in 1 John. And he's trying to help them know for sure that they know the Lord Jesus. He's just trying to help them because there's some who, who fake it. And so he says in verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Oh, 1 John 3, 7. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, talking about God, is righteous. Now, he's not talking about uh, a good work salvation. He's talking about the, the good things that come out of a person uh, because they're made righteous. Verse 8, he who sins is of the devil. Now, he's not saying here that if you ever sin, automatically from the devil. What he's saying is he who sins continually is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We've just celebrated his resurrection where he obviously did that. Colossians 2, 15 even talks about that. <clears throat> then here's the one, here's the verse that gets everybody. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And so, what is that? Is that talking about sinless perfection? No. It, it, let me just explain this something to you. <clears throat> Whoever has been born of God does not sin as a lifestyle, it not, does not continue on in sin. And this is one of the illustrations. Lily and I talked about this. We're basically born with the nature of a hog that likes to wallow in the mud. Okay? So, no. Listen, I got eight, uh, seven grandsons. Do they want to take a bath? No. They don't want to do that. But one of them likes to shower a bunch. But that's another issue. But basically, hogs like to wallow in the mire, right? That's just what hogs do. They just get all oozy goozy. -ed. But God changes us from a hog to a sheep. And sheep don't like to wallow in the mire. They can fall in the mud, but they don't want to stay there. You're a sheep. You can fall in the mud. but You don't want to stay there. You want to get out and you want to clean up, right? That's what he's saying here. Uh, and in Peter, he's talking about false prophets. We've read about those. He says, listen, the saying is true. A dog returns to its vomit. A hog returns to wallow in the mire. Why does a dog do that? I remember saying, uh, we had, when I was a kid, Oscar, um, the uh, bulldog down the street, uh, the, the, the neighbors had this bulldog, and he threw up. And we're kids, okay, seven, eight, nine years old. And what does he do? He goes back and eats it. And we're going, ooh, right? Gross. Why did he do that? Because he's a dog. It's the nature of a dog. Why do hogs like to wallow in the mire? It's the nature of a hog. But sheep don't do that. And that's what John is trying to say to folks there. So how does one that used to like wallowing in the mire 
become like a sheep who doesn't want to wallow in the mire, who wants to stay clean. Well, God, he even says, he says, make the tree good. God's got to change us from the evil heart to the good heart, to his kind of good. He's talked about this all over the place. In Ezekiel, he says, I'm going to take out the heart of stone, which means insensitive, hard, whatever, and make it a heart of flesh, sensitive, tender, whatever the case may be. He changes it. I mean, that's a big change from stone to, to heart, flesh, right? Uh, it's a big deal. Soft and sensitive, good works. And he says here, out of the good treasure of his heart, come forth what is good. And you find this up, let me give you an example. We've, you've quoted this a hundred times, Ephesians 2.10. For God, we are his workmanship. Uh, it's the word, uh, we get our word poem from it. Uh, some people try to say that masterpiece. We're his symphony, if you will. <clears throat> Created what? For good works which God has thought about, prepared beforehand that we should keep on walking in them. I'm not talking about sinless perfection at all, but I am talking about right direction. And that's what he wants. Uh, good fruit, good treasure, good words uh, are coming out of this heart, uh, out of the mouth. It's fit, the, the heart's full of what? Well, when God comes and changes the person, they're born again, he wants us to be full of his spirit. That's the point of all the parables, not be self-filled, but to be spirit-filled. Uh, not to be self-willed, but to be God-willed. That's what he wants. And I'll, I'll just mention a couple of verses. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, that's good, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Why? For we are members of one another. I know y'all not real crazy about this, but if you're believers, guess what? You're my brother or sister, and those people sitting next to you, if they're believers, they're your brother or sister. We're in a family. Now, there's some odd bobs in the family, okay? I'm not saying there's not, but we're still family. We just are. And that's what he wants us to understand. Ephesians 4.29, I love this. Let no unwholesome word. <clears throat> uh, one translation translates that rotten word. Uh, have you ever had a rotten potato or tomato or whatever in your refrigerator? Anybody? I mean, we have. <laughs> what do you do with it? You throw it away. Nobody says, oh, I'll eat that. I mean... And there might be, the odd Bob might eat it, okay? But generally speaking, you throw it away. Let no unwholesome, rotten word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, for building up, according what? To the need of the moment. There's a timing to say what you need to say in a right way, even if it's a word of correction. It's just, that's what it is. And what does it happen? It says, so that it will give grace God's grace God's working to those who hear so let's just land the plane here and make an application what's coming out of your mouth if it's meanness it could be revealing a mean heart uh, if it's kindness it could be revealing a kind heart uh, if it's impurity or lewdness or cringy stuff it could be Revealing kind of a yucky heart, you know, um, a heart that needs changing by the Lord Jesus himself to be like God's heart. So good fruit, good treasure, good foundation. We don't want to stop yet till we get this one nailed down. The good father wants a good foundation for every house. He wants rock, not sand. Why? In that parable in Matthew 7, uh, it's the same storm. We all face storms. The house built on the rock stands. I've got a picture in my phone somewhere. Uh, Hurricane Matthew hit the panhandle of Florida, Cat, Cat 5. I mean, it just wiped it out. I, I saw it probably a year and a half after it hit, and it still looked, looked like it had hit last week. It was a mess. But they had one picture there of a house that looked like it was just 
brand new. It weathered the storm. Why? Because the builder built it to withstand Cat 5. And it did. And boy, you can imagine people going, who's your builder? I, wanna, I want that kind of house, right? And that's what God's trying to say here. I want you to have a good foundation. Rock, not sand. Obedience, not disobedience. How many of you love, just love having an, an obedient child or grandchild? It's kind of nice, isn't it? Sweet, right? That's what you want. You want just to obey, just obey, 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 right? That's what you want. And that's what God wants in his children. He wants us, by the way, let me just say this. Well, I'm not going to build a house. No, 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 no. Everybody's building. Everybody. It's not, it's not an option here. But you need to choose your foundation, rock or sand. Storm's going to come. Everybody faces storms. We all face storms. One storm, same storm, different results based on the foundation, good or bad, strong and sturdy uh, or weak and crumbly. That's the kind of thing. So we either pay attention to him or we avoid him. We obey or we disobey. And so what does that lead us to? Well, there's only one good way, Jesus' way. Remember what he said here? Enter through the narrow gate. Then he, meant, then he starts contrasting. The gate is wide, the way is broad, and it leads to destruction. Then he contrasts it. There are many over here who enter. Then he contrasts says this. There's a small gate and a narrow way, and it leads to life, and there's few. He's contrasting here. Jesus himself said this, okay? I mean, we've quoted it a gazillion times. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's one door. It's not like 17 doors, like the world wants to think, where you can get to heaven any old way. No, you can't get there any old way. Any more than you can get to name a city. Just name one. You want to go to Boston? Okay. You could go up 95. That's, that's a choice. But if you're going north to Boston, you're not going to get to Miami. Why? Because that's not the way to go there. You got to, instead of turning north to Boston, you got to turn south to Miami. Now, 95 will get you to Miami. If that's where you want to go, fine. But the point is, there's only one way. Jesus is the way. And Peter, now get this. Okay, that's Jesus. Okay, we, I forget what he said. Here's Peter. He heals the guy in Acts chapter 3. He's walking, leaping, praising God. By the way, that's pretty amazing. No therapy. Some of you have had to go through therapy. He didn't. He had never walked for decades. He's walking. He's leaping. He's praising God. Have you ever had knee surgery? And your doctor say, now, don't forget to do your jumps. No, they don't say that. They don't want you to leap. Uh, here's what you need to do, you know, whatever. But when Jesus heals, when he changes, and that's what he did. So Peter's saying, listen, guys, 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 let me talk to you. And he's talking to the rulers and the leaders who would not believe, that didn't want anything to do with Jesus. They're the ones who helped lead in his crucifixion. Peter says, there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven. And he's just talked about Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. No other options. And what's Peter basing it on? Well, right before that, he said, he's the stone rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. So, only one way. Now, let me land the plane. And I need to, need to show you this. Now, this is going to take work, okay? We're going to go to the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah. Thankfully, it's a big book. It's after Isaiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 6, okay? Why am I going there? Because Jesus quoted it. In Matthew 11, 28, 29, 30, he says, listen, if you're weary and heavy laden, you come to me, and I'll give you rest. It's a given rest. 
And I want you to take my yoke on you and learn from me. And then he says this, you'll find rest for your soul. So there's a given rest and there's a found rest. He says, listen, I'm gentle and humble, not harsh and proud like some of the leaders of his day. I'm gentle and humble. And if you'll learn from me, you'll find rest for your soul. And then he talks about an ongoing rest. And even that's Matthew 11, Matthew 12. He illustrates it to his disciples because he's what? The Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of rest. But he quotes from Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah is really, really, really trying hard to get these people to get it. And they're not getting it so well. Look at verse 16. This is what the Lord says. He said it to people in that day. Jesus is saying it to people in his day uh, about mm, 600 years later. Stand in the way and see. Ask for the old paths or ancient paths where the good way is. He's telling you a good way. Have you ever gotten directions from somebody that was a bad way? I mean, you got there, but surely there's a better way than this. You want to know the good way. Oh, yeah, don't, don't, don't go that way. Yes, that's big, a lot of construction. Here, let me tell you this way. And you go, are you sure? I'm, I'm sure. And sure enough, you take that other way, it's nice. There's no traffic. It's sweet. Whereas if you'd gone that other way, uh, you'd have been very frustrated. And Jesus is saying here, God's saying this to his people. This is where the good way is. Walk in it. Then look, what does he say? Then you'll find rest for your souls. That's exactly what Jesus just said. He's quoting from this verse. But they said, we will not walk in it. And some people did that to Jesus too. You see, it's a life and death matter. It's a choice now, actually, moment by moment, it's a, it's a point. We, we're talking about Jesus had a triumphant entry, triumphant exit. We can celebrate that on Easter, but what we want to have is a, a triumphant living Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, traffic, uh, financial whatever. I, I was working on my taxes this week. Oh, y'all love doing that. I don't love doing that. And I found, oh, man, you know, I just found one of those. So I told Lenny, I said, we got to check this out, whatever. Do I enjoy doing that? Mm, no, I'd much rather go to Disney. But it's just what it is. But you can have victory even in that, right? And that's what he wants to do. It's, it's something moment by moment. He, he even says that in Matthew 11. Um, a triumphant living or loser living. He wants us to have triumphant living, not loser living, and that's what he wants for you, his victorious life. I mentioned in the Beacon article, and if you don't remember this, you can go back and read it. It's, it's not really a long article, but I mentioned five basic books. I mentioned one of them last week, The Calvary Road by Roy Hessian. The second one I mentioned was The Saving Life of Christ by Major Ian Thomas. I'm just encouraging you, read it. And, and let it soak in, and then read it again, and let it soak in, then read it again. And it's just those kind of books, right? That's what he wants. And let's just boil it down to, to this, because um, it's time for us to go home and eat dinner. Two facts. There is a difference. Life or death. Right way or wrong way. Good way or evil way. Good fruit or bad fruit. There's a difference. And two, there's a choice, self-will or God's will. And that's what we want. Uh, one of the thought here hit me last night as I was going to sleep. I thought, oh, that's a good thought. So I got up and wrote it down. Christians never say goodbye to one another. Why? <laughs> We've got an eternity together. We're going to be family. And by the way, that person that bothers you won't bother you in heaven. Okay? We can say, really, good day. Good day. Because that's what God wants us to have. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you 
show us you are the good way. You show us the good way. You direct us. You don't hide things from us. You make it clear enough for us to take the next step. And Lord, I pray that you'll do that even now in these moments, in this invitation time, as we think on what you've said, as perhaps there's one thing you're saying to each heart. We've prayed for that. We ask that. And Lord, if someone doesn't know you, may you genuinely convict them to call on you, to come to you, to cry out to you, to, to forgive and change forever. And Lord, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.